Welcome to the Bernie's Bootlegs Podcast, where we explore the stories of successful musicians and share their perspectives on how to be a professional artist in a digital age. I'm your host, Kenny McCabe, and let's get into the show. What's up, podcast? Today I'm bringing you my interview with trombonist Nick Finzer. In addition to being an active performer, Nick is a professor at University of North Texas and is also the CEO of the record label Outside in Music. We discuss his upbringing in Rochester, New York, the most important things he has his students focus on, what it's like managing a record label, and a lot more. You can find Nick on Instagram at Nick Finzer and also on his website, nickfinzermusic.com. And so without further ado, I bring you my conversation with Nick Finzer. All right, guys, I'm here with Nick Finzer. Nick, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. How's it going? Going great. Uh, just uh, trying to keep all the plates spinning. Uh, lots of lots of things happening this fall. So uh, yeah, just trying to trying to keep everything balanced and move keep moving. Right on. So tell us where you are right now. Uh, right now, I am at the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas, which is just outside of Dallas. Uh, this is this my second year teaching here at UNT. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just, that's where I am now. But, uh, yeah, back and forth between here in New York and and all over, depending on uh, the month. Right. And so you're kind of back and forth between Texas and New York, but where are you originally from? I grew up in Rochester, New York. So I know that upstate, upstate New York life. Yes, of course. And um, I actually more common for me to go south to new york from where i am in albany than to go over to rochester it's kind of funny sure. people people don't realize it if they're not from new york which is that rochester is is far like it's, it's far from albany yeah yeah it's it's like four or five hours or something and so new york city is actually closer which is which is interesting and interesting too like philadelphia is closer to to me than rochester is which is oh really yeah I never thought about that. yeah which is funny but um, yeah, so tell us a little bit about Rochester growing up there, um, your, your musical background and, uh, what your formative years were like. Sure. Yeah. Well, growing up in Rochester, I didn't know at the time, but there was a kind of a glut of great jazz education a- around for, for me to eventually access. That wasn't the original path for me, but, um, I grew up uh, in, in a high school out in a suburb outside of Rochester that had a pretty strong music program in all different areas. And I was involved in, you know, uh, wind ensemble and choir and theater and just all different things. And then also in Rochester is the Eastman School of Music. And so when I was in high school, I started playing in a big band that met on Saturdays there and uh, fell in love with the music of Duke Ellington and then d- ended up going to Eastman for my undergrad. And at the same time as that, um, the Rochester Jazz Festival, which is now a pretty great festival, pretty big festival, was in its infancy stage when I was in high school and starting college. And so got to kind of get to know the people that started that festival and be involved in the early days of that. And so now seeing that grow into such a huge thing is pretty great for for the um, community there. And then you know, there's also a really great jazz radio station in Rochester. And so I didn't know how rare or lucky that was to have all those resources until, until later on, you know? So, uh, sometimes, sometimes, you know, I might say like, Oh, there's not that much happening in Rochester. I got to get out. But, you know, for a city of that size, there's a lot of, a lot of great music happening, a lot of great musicians, uh, in the area. And, and yeah, so it was really a fertile place to grow up and, you know, there was opportunities to, you know, I had a band and since high school playing, you know, different clubs and stuff. And, you know, then, but I already always had it in my brain that, um, after undergrad, I was going to go to New York. And so I just, that was always the goal and my focus kind of singularly from, you know, 10th or 11th grade, the first time I went to New York on, I was just like, that's what I'm doing. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm going to make it happen. So that eventually in 2010, that, uh, that happened. Of course. I love it. So let's back up a little bit. And uh, if you could just tell us uh, a little bit about how the trombone entered your life and how it came to be that you are a trombone player, because trombone is not an easy instrument. Um, Well, I've always been kind of tall for my age. And so I put down on my in elementary school, my little preference sheet. It said drums, 
trumpet and trombone. And they said, Oh, trombone. Yeah. Well, you're, you're tall. You're going to play trombone. So, uh, at first I had no idea what I was getting myself into, obviously, but, um, I had some really great like friends that also played trombone. Like all of us became kind of friends and I went elementary school and that kind of pushed me through. And I had one really good friend who ended up, we were in high school together and then at Eastman together. And so kind of without that person, uh, his name is, is Rick and he, without him, he would have, I don't think I would have been kind of pushed in the direction that I was. Both of us were very kind of very good friends, but also kind of competitive with one another. So it was a good, um, spirit to try to drive us both forward. But around that time in middle school, I had a really great band director who showed me, uh, the Eastman trombone choir, which is, was actually one of the first schools to ever have a trombone choir. And there's a very rich, deep kind of trombone history at Eastman, um, for anyone that cares. <laughs> and, um, so I kind of was like in a right place to be able to go down and like hear them. And I kind of fell in love with the instrument from there and, uh, wanted to be a classical player. And then when I auditioned for like the youth symphony and realized how stressful that was and like preparing excerpts and trying to play this thing perfectly and exactly like everyone told me how to play it, I realized it was not for me and, uh, moved in a different direction. But, um, so that's kind of how trombone entered my life. But, it's always stuck stuck with me, you know. I try to stay involved with the both sides of the music, and uh, it just has a good sound in a group, you know. <laughs> Not every instrument sounds good in a group. Definitely, man. And um, I'm a saxophone player, and uh, I like to say that playing the saxophone is my longest standing habit, and, uh, <laughs> and it really is. And so you just pick it up, and it just kind of sticks with you like like glue. So. But uh, that that isn't to say that there aren't days where I, where I want to throw it in the trash, as I'm sure you sure, oh, yeah. sure you know. But <laughs> oh yeah. So um, were your parents and your family always uh, relatively supportive of your decision to do music, or did, did they kind of push you towards it at all, or did they kind of want you to do something safer? What was the uh, the story there? Um, well, I guess it it was both. It was they were both very 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 supportive and also very trepidatious at the same time. Um, my mom was is a flutist, and she, uh, they, she, they, my parents both also grew up in upstate New York, and she was going to attend Ithaca, Ithaca College for music, and then she decided to not do that and get married instead. So she kind of always had this thing in the back of her mind about what would have happened if, you know, she had gone into music. So she was always supportive of any decisions that I made and going in that direction, which was really uh, great, you know, looking back. My dad was a little bit more practical. He demanded that I have a backup plan, um, wanted me to get a music education degree or a business degree, just kind of double major. At that time at Eastman, you couldn't really do, do a, a double degree with um, the university that it's associated with. Uh, now you can, but you couldn't at that time when I started. But um, I just said, no, I'm not going to do that because if I have a backup plan, I'm going to fall back on the backup plan. So I'm going to go with no net and go just go and uh, – if I fail, I fail, and then I'll figure it out something else. So um, they were supportive. They're definitely supportive, a hundred percent. But there was like the little bit of tension of like, what are you going to do with yourself and all of this? But um, things have turned out just fine, and so they've continued to um, be supportive, and 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 so it kind of worked out. There wasn't like any huge blow up moment, but there was definitely always tension between <laughs> my dad and I, of like. What are you going to do? Are you sure you can make money doing this? Are you, you know, and that's a real conversation. But, you know, I kind of really did believe and do believe that if you are dead set on being a performer, that you really have to, you know, put yourself in a situation where you it's either sink or swim, because uh, if you want to make it, you're going to make it happen. You know, and if and if maybe it wasn't for you, then you'll figure it out pretty fast. You know, I think I think that real world experience is super super important important at some point in your career to figure it out yeah and of course you have to have empathy for your parents you know because they just want you to be successful obviously i, I you know oh hopefully, yeah hopefully and so um it's, of course. it's it's not unreasonable for them to be concerned about making money as a musician because it is a very hard career especially in you know 2019 you have to basically do everything yourself no one no record <laughs> label is going to you know hand you a career you know, as, right. as, it, as it somewhat used to be. And so you got to have empathy for that. But at, at the same time, the results speak for themselves, you know. And so I think it's, uh, uh, it's something that uh, parents will, will eventually reconcile with, um, you know, when you're successful, which uh, you seem to be doing okay. So 
I think that uh, it's, things have worked out so far. Yes, <laughs> so far so good, as they say. So, um, so you're in, you're at Eastman. Tell us like an average day of uh, practicing and and playing, and uh, what what Eastman was like. Ooh, well, um, it kind of changed a lot during the course of time there, um, from freshman year on. I mean, I, I think there was always a lot of practicing involved, but um, I was always someone who wanted to builds other things in, in addition, meaning, uh, I always had a teaching studio. So I would always, I was always teaching and, um, I would teach like area groups, like maybe a high school marching band or something like that. So I would be like always kind of running around and teaching and, and playing. I luckily what playing opportunities there were in Rochester, I was kind of connected to cause I was from there. So I knew, you know, who the people were. So I was kind of always gigging from the time I started school uh, which was not the case for everybody, just because they didn't they didn't know who to know, you know, to, in order to get gigs where the music was happening. But um, you know, the, it kind of changed a lot or, between freshman year and junior year. By the time it was junior year, I was teaching like 20 students a week, and I was pro- kind of more focused on my professional career than school for sure. By the time junior senior year happened, but freshman and sophomore year, I was really just I was I wanted to get into like the top ensembles at school, and like there was just a uh, a sense that I knew somehow that I was really, I felt like I was really far behind and I had a lot to catch up on. So I was really focused on trying to get those things together. Um, during that time, I was also studying with Wycliffe Gordon, who was in the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra. So I was like driving down from Rochester to the city like once a month or so, or every couple months to get lessons. And so I was trying to do that. And, um, I don't know. It's it kind of a blur looking back, but it was definitely a lot of practicing and uh, a lot of just like head down, getting as much experience as I could, playing and saying yes to every single gig, uh, maybe to the detriment of my uh, personal life. But, you know, it was like I wasn't really hanging out. I wasn't, you know, going to parties and stuff. I was like at gigs or like hanging out, doing um anything that people someone asked me to do i just wanted to get experience doing everything because i was i wasn't sure exactly what i wanted to do i just knew that i wanted to play and i wanted to be somebody who you could call and i would do a great job regardless of what it was whether it was jazz or else else something else <laughs> so, so. You, you finish at eastman and when do you move to new york and just on a very practical level how did you make that happen so I took a year off after school, uh, solely focused on getting into grad school. Um, I skipped a grade in elementary school, so I felt like I just kind of put that extra year at the end instead of in the middle. Uh, so I took a year off, and I wanted I had always wanted to get into Juilliard, and I didn't get in for my undergrad. And so it was a, the kind of a chip on my shoulder kind of moment where I was like, I'm going to freaking do this. And uh, so I took a whole year off to do that. And my plan was I was either going to go to Juilliard or MSM or I was going to move to New York. So I was saving money. Like I said, I was working a lot. Uh, and so I was saving money and doing that. And then luckily it worked out that I got accepted to Juilliard um, and, and Manhattan. And I decided to go to Juilliard. It seemed like one of those things when it comes along, like I should probably do this. you know. And so I did that. And that's kind of what got me to New, to New York. Um, like I said, I was saving money and stuff like that in case I needed to do it on my own and figure it out, but um, that didn't happen that way. So grad school basically brought me to New York and connected me with a lot of the players that I play with, you know, all the time. And and it was really just kind of the best community of musicians to get to know once once I was there. Yeah, and I think that's a really common, you know, use for for school, which is to be in the city that you want to be in while you, while you're in school, and it's a great bridge for being able to move to it to a place that you want to be. So I think that that is uh, is, is is super cool. So um, once you graduate from grad school, tell us about uh, what kind of gigs you're playing, who you're playing with, what that uh, those first few years out of school were like. Sure. Yeah. So I finished in 2012. Um my master's and right before graduation, the week before graduation, I recorded my first record in between the last day of class and, and uh, graduation. So I had that kind of together with, with the most of the same band. That's my band now. And, um, 
so we did that. The kind of gigs I was playing was any type of gig that would uh, come my way. Uh, luckily, Eastman, like I said, has a really strong trombone kind of history. So there's a lot of trombonists in New York from Eastman that I was able to connect with. And I was subbing on Broadway shows and doing that. And I got connected with a couple, you know, corporate bands and playing all the regular kind of party band stuff that you you do to make money and some of those same people connected me into there's a huge like orthodox jewish wedding scene that uh is kind of totally off the radar and i would never have known about but you know it's work just like any other work and so i was doing that and i wasn't playing necessarily that you know that many jazz gigs but i really was focused on there's you know a couple of people that i really wanted to play with one of those people was Maria Schneider and her jazz orchestra. So I used to go and just uh, actually sell CDs at the Jazz Standard during the week of uh, Thanksgiving when they would play there. That was something I made like an annual thing. I'm going to do that because I want to be around and I want to meet these people and um, doing all that kind of stuff. And I started playing with a group uh, that got pretty relatively well known called Postmodern Jukebox, which is like this YouTube cover band basically. And so around that time, 13, 14, uh, they started touring, touring internationally. So I started kind of doing a bunch of stuff with them and uh, started doing that kind of on and off from, you know, 13 to 16. And then in tr from 2014 to 2016, I got a visiting professor gig at Florida State University. So I was down there a couple days a week teaching. Uh, I know this is a long answer to your question, but uh, they kind of all, all that stuff was all coalescing kind of at the same time. And I was trying to keep my, I was, trying to keep all the things going, you know, the teaching and the playing in New York and the touring and making rec my own records. But, um, started playing with like, um, the Gil Evans project, which is a big band led by Ryan Truesdell. I did some subbing in the Lincoln center jazz orchestra around that time, 14 or 15, uh, did some touring with them. So that's, yeah, that's the long short answer. <laughs> yeah. So is playing in a big band format, something that you've always inherently enjoyed because, you know, as a trombone player, there's, I think it's safe to say that there's less, you know, small group work for trombone players. There's a lot of big band work. And so can you just talk a little bit about that and um, how you connect with it? Well, the, how I connect with it is that that was my connection to jazz in the first place. You know, the music of Duke Ellington was the music that hit me first in the jazz area. And so that, that from that time on that trombone section, from that band is that has always been in my ear. So, um, and you're right. So trombone players have to play in sections a lot. We don't, it's not, you're not always getting to play our Blakey tributes and there's a trombone player in the band or something like that. It's, you know, it's one of those extra instruments after saxophone and trumpet and that's fine. But, uh, yeah, so we end up playing a lot of like, you know, salsa gigs and, and uh big band gigs but um yeah i mean i love playing in a big band it's it's great uh i also love playing in a small group you know a lot of the bands that i play with now i find kind of have a hybrid of the two skill sets kind of put together kind of like a you know nonets or 10 piece bands you know I, I have kind of been an area where i've been able to um work a lot so it's been a, a case where you have to have a kind of a strong solo voice and be able to play in an ensemble and that's something that you know going to school at eastman was like so important in terms of developing that like ensemble awareness um, that's definitely something i felt like when i observed the undergrads at juilliard something that they were not getting because they didn't have the same um, requirements in terms of playing in other kinds of non-jazz ensembles but that's not uh, that's a conversation for another day perhaps but um but yeah tell us a little bit about the most important things that you think about when you are playing in a in a trombone section of maybe not necessarily jazz but you know maybe a big band or any kind of large group setting what are the main things that you think about well that's a good question um playing very uh as close as i can to whoever's playing the lead part um, trying to match the style, trying to support that person. If I am that person, I'm trying to lock in with the, you know, the other sections. Um, I always say you have to be listening more to everybody else than to yourself. You know, you shouldn't really hear yourself at all. You should just know that you're doing the right thing. You're playing the right thing and you're trying to make it as musical as you can with the people around you. Um, 
you know, just making sure that the section has great, is really together, has great time and a, and a good, and a great sound is, those are the important things. I think, you know, it's something you never, um, trombone sections in general are something you never miss until they're gone. You know, like if you hear a big band, there's a great trombone section. Uh, if you take it away, you'll notice a big, a big difference. You know, it's like that. It's, I mean, the saxophones is a big part of the sound too, but the trombone section, there's something about the, the quality of the sound that really kind of fattens up the middle of the ensemble. So if you, you know, if you're missing it out or if it's really sloppy or it doesn't have a good sound, it can be detrimental. But. Is, is reading and sight reading something that you consciously worked on or did you just kind of get better at it through experience? Oh, no, I consciously worked on it. I wanted to be a perfect sight reader, and I still strive to be a perfect sight reader. I think it should be – the expectation is that I'm going to play it right the first time, and that's always been my expectation of myself, so I've held myself to that standard because I just like – you know, I want to practice what I want to practice, so I want to be able to <laughs> sight read at a way that I don't have to practice my ensemble music. I wanted to be able to play it right the first time. So that was the the first – thing and then there was just too many people that came to visit school and give master classes that said oh yeah you got to sight read it right the first time that i just said okay that's just the expectation and so i've just always had that expectation that that, that was what it was going to be i had a teacher who made me sight read every single lesson so it was not a foreign thing like we did it all the time and it was just something that became an, an expectation and so uh, that's how I try to instill in my students. It's like not really a question. It's like not really a skill. You just do it. You just do it right. Like you just read it like you're reading a book. And uh, sometimes, of course, we're all going to screw up. But it's like that's just the expectation that I have. Are there any books or resources that you could point people towards that you found very uh, valuable in learning to improve your sight reading skills? Oh, no, just get as much music and sight read it all, just different styles all the time. Sight read, make it just a part of something you do either either every week or every day and just all different things. And so that's why I try to do that to my students. You know, we sight read something different, whether it's uh, a tune, trying to sight read changes, uh, a big band part, uh, transcription, reading tenor clef, reading treble clef, you know, all different kinds of stuff. So just keep reading different stuff. Get as much music as you can. I mean, you can find them, every, anything you want is online. So just go and read everything. Definitely. I like that a lot. I think that's, uh, that's a good way to put it. So obviously education has always been a very big part of your career in music, whether that's teaching privately or teaching at UNT like you're doing now in, in more of a, a formalized uh, setting. So what besides sight reading, what are some other topics that you find that are often lacking in students' uh, uh, level of preparation and things that you try and get them to, to focus on? It's a great question as well. Um, often lacking is, is an awareness of the ensemble playing. I mentioned that before. Um, a, a level of awareness of just like musicality that's outside of the technique of their instrument. A lot of times we get caught up like, oh, I got to be able to play at this tempo or this fast or blah, 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 blah. When for me, the most important things to focus on are developing a really great sound because if you don't sound good, nobody really wants to call you back. You can make a lot of mistakes, but have a great sound and get called back, you know, because you, you bring that personality. When you think about Miles Davis, John Coltrane, all the great artists, you think about the first thing is not like, oh, how many notes did they play? It was It's the sound that pops, at least to me, into my mind's eye or ear. You know, I don't think of, when I think of Monk, I think about his sound. I don't think about like, like, uh, you know, what notes he played, you know? So, um, that's something that I find sometimes is, is lacking. And then something more recently that I found and discovered about students that are coming to jazz school is that, um, I'm not sure that they all come to jazz school because they like jazz. I think they come because it's not classical music mm. and they, it, it kind of gets lumped into, Oh, well, I'll just get a jazz degree because it's, uh, not classical and it's not music education. And I think that's because a lot of there's not a lot of options in terms of like you can't major in horn section playing. <laughs> it's, not, it's not really a thing. So at the moment anyway. And so I, th I find that there's a lot of people that are going to school for the for jazz that maybe don't actually like jazz that much, which is kind of interesting to me. Uh, and I guess I, that's because my own personal experience is there's so much, so much tunnel vision going on that I didn't have an awareness that there were other people going to school that maybe didn't 
that weren't obsessed with the thing, that thing. And so, um, that, I find that to be interesting, but, um, I find the, the, the weakest things is just like developing their ears. People don't learn tunes by ear. They have iReal B app and that's like my least favorite app. I'm starting to sound like an old man uh, about these things. I'm like, man, that happened really fast. All of a sudden I'm on the other side of that. But, uh, uh, just just a crutch on things like uh, like that, you know, just not learning tunes, just like pulling out the changes on their phone and stuff. And not that I think you need to know every tune, but you should your ear should be good enough that you can at least play simple tunes without having to read them off the I real B. But yeah, those are a couple of things. <laughs> Definitely. And, uh, you know, maybe it's a different story if uh, you're, you know, trying to read stable mates or something. But if it's some diatonic tune and you can't hear it, that's that's a problem. I think you. Would kind of, yeah, it's like, uh, I'm not so sure if you're going on the right path here or you haven't put in the time to develop your ears yet, which you should probably do. How would you go about developing your ears or how did you and uh, what are some things that you uh, have your students do in order to develop their ears besides, you know, the obvious things like listening and transcribing? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, no, first of all, the first thing is to know that it's going to suck. You know, you're going to suck at it, especially if you don't have perfect pitch, which I do not. And it was really hard for me. But um, first, yeah, that first thing, realizing it's going to suck, knowing it's going to suck, knowing it's going to take more than a week, you know, is like you just have to be patient is the first thing and, and do do the work. Singing, number one, is really important. Being able to sing whatever you're working on. Um I always did choir. I was talking about that, and I never thought it would, was all that relevant until uh, I had to do, you know, oral skills class in college. And then I was like, oh, it's a good thing I sang a lot because now I don't have to work that hard at this class. But um, so singing is really important. And the single most important thing that I ever did, number one, was throw away my giant stack of real books and decide that I was going to learn all the tunes by ear and uh, learn them all on the piano. So. I don't play piano very well, but I play enough to figure out the changes to tunes and accompany my students, and uh, they will tell you badly, but uh, just enough to get by, and that one thing developed my ears more than anything else, but there's some other great tools that I love. There's an app that Stefan Harris put out called Harmony Cloud. I really like that app, and um, there's a million things online for like learning intervals and all that stuff, but... I find like all that stuff you can learn pretty easily. I feel like it's the hearing chord changes, the hearing the root movement, hearing the quality of extensions is something that's more difficult. But the thing to do is you just have to do it. Like it's going to suck, but just keep trying until you get it. Because once you get it, then you're going to be so happy you did. And, you know, the only thing that got me to do it was once I got to grad school and I had to learn way more tunes than I even knew in the course of a year. And I was like, I have to get a new system for this. And so that's, that's what I did. That's what you should do. Learn the piano. Or if you already play piano, you probably already have pretty good ears. Yes. In most cases, or perfect pitch always helps, but you know, not all of us sure. have that. So, um, exactly. yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. And the, one of the thing that I think is highly underrated is just incremental improvement. And so you say, yes, it's, it's going to suck. But if you can, you know, have your ears be a little bit better, 1% better or a tenth yep. of a percent better the next day, then that just compounds over time. And I think that's that's pretty much how you get better. Exactly. You're exactly right. That hit the nail on the head. Cool. So uh, one thing that I also wanted to touch on is uh, your YouTube channel, because uh, that is also a place where you are uh, graciously sharing a lot of uh, tips and other uh, informative material. And so. Um, when, you, when do you release those videos? Is it, it's once per week, right? Uh, yeah, I try to at minimum do one a week and those come out on Wednesdays, Wednesday mornings usually. And they kind of alternate between being like what you're talking about, educational content and then some also performance content. So, um, sometimes there's more than that per week, but I, I strive for one a week and I've done at least one a week since 2016 spring. So it's been a couple of years now. Right on. And I would definitely encourage everyone to go check that out. Um, if you just search Nick Finzer, I'm sure you'll find it. And so I wanted to ask you about that because what makes you actively decide that you want to make an educational video about a topic? Because there's obviously a gajillion topics that you could touch, but what 
is the impetus for you to actually sit down and record a video and try and get some information out into the, the YouTube sphere uh, regard, regarding that topic? Um, a lot of it is stuff that I share with some people in real life and in non-YouTube life. I guess it is real life. YouTube is also real life. But uh, like in person, like somebody comes to a lesson, I'm like, man, I really got to come up with something like what – why is this so hard for this person or like why what is it that i do that allows me to do this particular thing that maybe somebody else hasn't practiced so that's usually what it is it's a real life experience it's a one-on-one thing with a student it's seeing the same thing with 10 students and be like man what could i what could we do that would be helpful and then taking that and turning it some kind of exercise either short or long some of them are pretty long some of them are pretty short so um just uh i don't know i decided in 2016 after i was leaving this visiting professor gig that i had that i was like all right if i'm going to leave this what am i going to do uh with my time with like that extra time i'm not flying to florida once a week and teaching so i decided all right i'm going to do a youtube channel and because you know there's a lot of times i get messages from people on instagram like i'm in such and such place i can't afford to go to college and all of this kind of thing i'm like well they should be able to practice jazz stuff too i mean they shouldn't have to go and spend you know whatever amount of money that's a lot in most cases for for college to just to study this jazz music whether you can find out about anything else on youtube why shouldn't there be like jazz trombone stuff and i noticed you know that i have a couple colleagues on youtube who are do trombone stuff but a lot of them don't focus on the educational at least jazz as jazz education aspect of it so i was like oh well it's not a huge amount of people out there that want this information but i know that they're there because i get the emails so uh let me just answer this once instead of a hundred times and uh, put it on youtube right on so maybe the college thing is something we can touch on a little bit too uh what heuristics would you use or recommend someone use for deciding whether or not they should pursue a degree in music? Uh, an undergraduate or a graduate? Let's say undergraduate. Undergraduate. Um, if they should check it out. Um, I think if they are really passionate about it and, and they feel like it's something they want to try and see if they can do if they have if it's like you know people always put it to me like if you think you could do anything else you should do that thing that's anything else i don't know if i agree with that 100 percent that statement i think undergrad is supposed to be a time of exploration i don't think you need to have it figured out by the time you're 18 i think it's put on people that they need to figure it out by middle school and then high school is just to get about getting into college and whatever Maybe it's changing. I think it is changing probably for the next generation. But for my people my age, that was the the vibe. It was figure out what you're going to do and go that direction from like ninth grade, tenth grade. Um, so first of all, don't feel like you if you go into music that you're like I'm committing to this right now, and try to go to a place where you can do multiple things. You know, Juilliard is amazing, but you can't really have a diverse experience there in terms of if you also want to check out business or math or anything, astronomy, whatever, you know, it's just, I, I, one thing I like about UNT is that the students have to take classes in other parts of the school because it gives them that chance to see, you know, non music college level instruction and how smart those professors are. You know, it's just a totally different thing from like, music professors not that music professors aren't smart but just like people are more like i feel more specialized i guess we're just just as specialized but just in something that you're too familiar with rather than unfamiliar but anyway so i think a a undergraduate shouldn't feel like they're tied into it they should uh you got to be really passionate about it though and feel like this is really something that i want to be able be able to do for the rest of my life but then have a kind of go to somewhere where there's a diverse experiences that you can have in terms of education and also know that you should consider the finances and uh, a music degree is not like a, uh, a getting a law degree or a doctor. You're not going to earn exponentially more based on the, the how, how prestigious your degree is, you know, and it's more about 
the teacher and you growing as a person and going out and getting things and making things happen than it is about um, like where you went, you know. So there's you can go to a lot of places and get a lot of inf- the same information. It's just going to be how much time and effort you put into it and, and the community that is around, you know. Like I was saying, at Juilliard is a great community of other students that really pushed me to just as much as the faculty did. So um, you got to be really passionate, but also don't feel like you're stuck. Like it's not the end decision. Like if you want to check it out, go and check it out and see and see if it's something that you want to explore for your life. Yes, definitely. And I think one thing that could not that could not possibly be overstated is follow the money for lack of a better term, because to uh, like you're saying, do an undergraduate and explore whether or not music is the right thing for you. If you're getting, you know, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars in debt to figure out what you want to do, that might not be the best option. And, and I think you probably agree with that. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I mean, I, yeah, I can't even fathom. I'm not going to bring up any particular schools, but there's certain tuition amounts. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, but, uh, yeah, just be careful. You know, I, as somebody that went to schools that aren't cheap, you know, and, and doing fine, I'm doing fine, but that, that money is there and, and it sits back here. And every once in a while, there's like little gremlins that kind of run up and you have to deal with them. So you just, you know, don't, don't not consider it. <laughs> yes. And, um, it was just like you were saying too. I mean, I think it's probably the case that for the most part, you can be as good as you want to be because it doesn't matter at a certain level. It doesn't matter which school you're at. It doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, it's not of utmost importance who your teacher is because at the end of the day, you have to practice, you have to put in the work. And right. so I think that, you know, in, in, in that sense, Sometimes uh, when you consider the financial uh, burden of going to, you know, a really prestigious school, you know, without a scholarship, then, uh, you know, you might consider other options. Definitely. Definitely. There's a lot of options out there, especially now. So, uh, yeah, don't get yourself in a mountain of debt if you're not sure. If you're sure, it might be worth it. You know, it might be. But if not, you know, you can always come back later. You don't have to go to school to be a great musician. That's for sure. That is definitely for sure. And so uh, let's uh, jump ahead a little bit. And I wanted to talk about your record label, which is Outside In Music. And Mm -hmm. my main question is, you started a record label. And my main question is, why? (laughs) Why? Uh, That's a great, that's a good question. Uh, I started it out out of lack of patience, I suppose. From my first record, I decided I I made it like I was saying before. And then we were like, how am I going to get this out? I asked a bunch of people. They all said we could do it, but not till, you know, a year from now or something like that. And I was like, well, I'm not waiting that long. And so I decided to go down my own and figure it out. And that's kind of just been my kind of personality for a little while. Just like, I'm not going to wait for these people. And then, um, so I did, I just started it not thinking much of it. I was just going to do my first record and it was whatever. And so I just started it on CD baby and put it out and that was fine. And then I did another project of mine, put it out on a different label and learned more things, discovered that I wanted number one, like more input into how it went, how everything went. And then I also realized that I spent more money than I needed to, uh, a lot more money than I needed to, uh, because I didn't understand how to assemble a team, um, to work the release in coordination with the label. So after that second record, I decided to go back to my thing and I was like, all right, let's see if I can make this into something, at least for me. And so I'm, the third record I made, I put it out on my label. And then the only reason that there, it grew past that is because my friends started to ask me questions. Uh, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I'm like, well, just send it to me. I can do it in five minutes. It's going to take me, it'll be faster for me to do this for you than to explain it to you. So just send it to me. So I started doing those things just like kind of like, how do I do the ISRC codes? What are ISRC codes? Where do I get a UC, UPC barcode? Where do you print the CD? It, all these like little tiny questions that I was like, oh, I can just put this together for you. So uh, then I just started distributing other friends' music. And then I just kind of more and more people started asking. And I put out music with another label and had another experience that I wasn't totally positive about. So I was like, you know what? This is, I'm just going to do this myself for real. And that, so basically around the same time, around 2016, uh, 2017, I was really, I started going more serious about it. I wanted to build something that was more than a record label. I usually call it a media company, uh, cause we focus on 
the 360 experience of the release, not just the music or printing CDs. You know, that's kind of the, the last thing that I really care about. The, there's not very many people that care about having the CDs except for the industry people and a few uh, people like your mom that want to have your CD and, <laughs> and other people. But, you know, there's not everyone wants a CD. And so we're trying to move away from that, focus on video content and focus on content around your music. And uh, so we also focus on doing artists, a broad range of artist services and social media management and just kind of coming at it from all different angles and trying to help people to participate in the 2020 and beyond music landscape rather than just saying, I wish people bought CDs. (laughs) Yep. Uh, I mean, a lot of people do wish that people still bought CDs, but the reality is cars aren't being made with CD players anymore. Exactly. Neither are laptops. Like the laptop I'm recording this on, it doesn't have a CD. Mine either. It has no CDs. I have hundreds of my own records and i have literally have nowhere to play them so and i run the label so there you go exactly so what are some things about starting and managing a record label that you wish that you knew before you started it um well i never started it with the idea that it was going to be a big thing so and it's not really a big thing i'd say it's a small thing that's growing fast but I wish I had known that I need to be conscientious of myself in all of it and um, that I can only give away so much of my time before it starts affecting other people in my life in a negative way. And uh, so I wish I had learned that earlier and, you know, something just learning about learning the numbers of your business that's not something i that's very sexy to talk about or interesting really but uh actually knowing what's happening from the business side i think a lot of times uh, i was always interested in like music business and industry classes and tried to take those things but none of the classes that i took ever dealt with the actual things that are happening now that i'm running a business so i encourage people to take actual business classes rather than to take music business classes because mostly it's about, oh, this is how you do your taxes and this is how you start a nonprofit. And all those things are great. And I've done all of those things. But running the day-to-day of a business and kind of knowing how to value your time and that it's like, you know what? I actually can't do this for you. I have to charge you for this even though you're my friend because I just I have no time. And if I do this for you, I need to be compensated. So that's a tough thing. Um, but uh, I wish I had known those things, and I wish that I had the skills of Nostra- Nostradamus and I could predict what the next thing is going to be in terms of the distribution of music, um, in terms of – because there's going to be something. I don't know what it is, though. In terms of like a physical product that re- represents the CD, you know, because the album is a throwback, you know, or the, the record, you know, is a throwback. So I don't know what's coming, but I wish I knew. Because <laughs> I would go for it. But, uh, yeah, just some of those things. Yeah, definitely. And so uh, what is what are the main things that you think about and uh, that help you decide whether or not to publish someone's record? Because I'm sure at this point, you know, outside of music is it's it's still relatively small when you compare yeah. it to like a sony or like a a, a massive yes. a massive record label but <laughs> yes. yeah, i'm sure that you have inquiries and you have to i don't know maybe you're, maybe you're not the one who personally deals with all of the 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 production inquiries of of people sending you the, the, their their concept or or whatever but um how how do you think about that uh you're right i recently started um putting in some there's a couple hurdles before you get to get to me listening uh, at this point, right? Which is okay, and but um, I the primary thing that I look for is somebody that's doing their own thing uh, and doing it at a high level. Meaning, if you're just gonna play the same standards that many people have recorded before in a way that sounds like it's at a jam session, I'm probably not gonna put it out. Um, but if those tunes are arranged in an interesting way and you have a certain vibe about you and you're presenting it in a strong way, then I'm interested. You know, I don't have like a quota. I don't put out like this many, I need this many, or I only do one. You know, I, I want, I want to help people get their music out that want to, you know, a big part of it is I, the artists retain a hundred percent of their publishing and a hundred percent of their copyrights and mm-hmm. stuff. And 
that was really important to me as an artist, as a, as a business person, it doesn't make any sense, but as an artist and a musician that makes, I want that. So that's why I offer that and I'm not going to take anything. So if that's something that's important to artists, then, you know, I want to be able to do that for them. So, um, having that, having that, uh, ability to have their own control of their own destiny, you know, of their own artistic destiny is important. So, uh, somebody that's doing their own thing, somebody that knows the value of that you're going to have to invest in the project. Um, like even if I could buy the master from them, they would still have to invest in publicity because we can't do it on our own. We need help. There's not enough hours in the day for you to practice and sit in front of the computer for 12 hours, sending people your music. You have to leverage the people that are in the industry that uh, can help share your music. So there's a, always a conversation about budget. So there might be great music, but if they have no money to put into it, I just I can't. I've stopped putting out music that doesn't have a budget for uh, publicity, unfortunately. Because just it's not going to do anything, you know, and it doesn't make sense for you and it doesn't make sense for me uh, to be able to put it out. So uh, those those two things are kind of the main things. But most people are understanding that they need they know they need to put something into it. Uh, and recently, you know, we've established a more of a, a, a new band leaders kind of imprint within our label called Next Level, which is just to help people when it's their first time that don't have a huge budget. So we kind of have a small budget focused Thing. So people know when it comes from this, this is like, oh, these are de debut band leaders. These are young people. Like, let me check these out because I want to see who's coming, you know. So instead, of, you know, a big part of having the label is just to have a community. You know, it's uh, you're not out there on your own. I mean, that, I feel like that's what's ha what happened with the industry is it kind of melted and everyone went out in a million different directions on their own. And it will continue to be that way, I think. But then also that people have coalesced into little communities where they can say, you know, yeah, like these people over here, they play a certain kind of way or the music is within this kind of sphere. I mean, it might be, it's wide ranging, but it fits in these different kind of curated communities. Excuse me. Um, so that's, you know, a, a big part of what we do as well. But it, I think that answered your question, but I think I might have steered off into my own la la land there for a second all good i love it when people steer off because it, it puts me on my toes you know so I, I i appreciate it and uh the next thing i wanted to ask you was just uh what distribution platforms are you currently utilizing uh in order to uh get the music out there into the world whether it's streaming or cd baby or any of those any of those platforms and then also what are your thoughts on streaming services like spotify like all of the the, the Pandoras of the world that um, pay pennies on the, or fractions of pennies on the dollar per stream. What, how do you think about that stuff? Um, which part do you want? I'll answer the first part first, because sure. it's the shorter answer. Uh, we put our music out everywhere. Um, I think y if you want to get known, I mean, you're not, none of the people on my label are Joe Lovano or Chris Potter or uh, snarky puppy or whatever. So, um, if you want to get known, which I think all of us and the people that would be contacting me are probably similar to me wanting to be uh, building our career. We're at the building phase. Um, I think you have to be everywhere because you're putting friction between you and the possible listener. If you're not on Spotify, if you're not on Apple music, if you're not on YouTube, uh, that's the biggest one I get pushed back about is YouTube because people think they're, they're just giving it away and they're not going to get anything from, but, um, we use, uh, we have a boutique distributor that's in LA called the, and, uh, they, they don't deal with artists directly. They only deal with labels. So you can't just like get in touch with these people. Uh, you have to have a hunt, you know, hundreds of releases, not like one. Um, so we, we put our stuff everywhere. Um, there's some platforms in Europe that are pretty intriguing that are paying more, um, what is, I don't even know how to say it. it's like Q U U something. I forget what it's called. It's a Dutch company, but, um, anyway, so we put our stuff everywhere. We don't use CD baby. We use uh, this distributor that has the ability to pitch directly to the editorial staff at Spotify and Apple music, which is super important. I mean, the best thing that you can do is get onto those, uh, editorial playlists and themed playlists from Spotify, um, because that's what gets you streaming money. Um, I want to rally the troops not against those streaming companies in general. I want to rally people to try to get the streaming companies to move the decimal point, just one decimal point over. Because there are people, you know, 
that are making a chunk of change uh, from these streaming platforms. You know, the main playlist for jazz is called State of Jazz mm-hmm. on Spotify. And uh, a friend sent me a, a check saying, they, oh, they made $2,000 last month from that. And approximately. And I, and I was like, man, if we could just move the decimal point over one, that 2000 becomes 20000 really fast. And that is really um, what we should be fighting for is higher you know, just a little bit of an increase in the way that the royalties are paid out rather than trying to fight the consumer who wants to stream the music and doesn't have a CD player. And so getting people to listen more would be more beneficial use of our time, I think. So you can see that I'm pro streaming uh, from this answer, I think. But um, and not because I think it's better, only because I think that's how people listen to music. And so I want to be everywhere and I want it to be as easy as possible to, for people to find my music. Um, I think that any worry I have about losing the 0. 0.0001 cents from that person uh, is made up for it in the fact that if they listen three times and then come follow my Instagram and then they come to a show, that already made up for um, the loss <laughs> of less than a penny from the stream. So I think I try to get all the artists to put all their stuff out as much as possible uh, everywhere. Some people decide they don't want to be in certain places, and I respect that and I understand it, but uh, that's not what I think. <laughs> I think we should go where people are and make it as easy as possible to find uh, your music. Definitely, and I think the conversation really needs to change, especially among musicians that are of you know, a, a, an older generation, you know, in, the, in, the, in their 40s or 50s or later, I think the conversation needs to change from being focused on that 9.99 or 14.99 that you might be losing on one album purchase when that person goes to Spotify and listens to it for basically nothing. The conversation has to change, I think, from being focused around that quote unquote loss to focusing on the lifetime value of that listener who found you on Spotify that otherwise wasn't going to buy your music at all. They just listen to someone else. Exactly. Exactly. You're totally right. Anyone that wants to, that listens to your music and really cares is one going to come to a show, which is worth more than them buying the CD. And what if they come to 10 shows? What if they follow you all over the place? Cause they love you so much. You know, it's like you're putting these hurdles there that don't need to be there. But yeah, it gets definitely the older generation feeling like they're losing out on the CD sales. Um, but if somebody like really likes you, they're going to buy your CD even though they don't have a CD player. So mm-hmm. Um, I just try to put, you know, put that out there, but trying to be creative, just as creative with the way you monetize your business is as important as being a great artist too. You know, at least nowadays, I don't think you can, this is maybe an over, over generalization, but I don't think you can really depend on the things you saw growing up as the ways to monetize your music. You know, you have to be more creative than that, I think. Oh yeah. And I mean, just look around, there's no record stores, there's no CD exactly. stores. I mean, yeah, where are you gonna go? You can get them on C. You can get them on uh, on Amazon. But the other thing that people don't remember is that you put your CD on Amazon for seventeen ninety nine, but then all the promo copies that you sent out to the radio, they end up getting listed by the used, you yes. know, whatever shop on Amazon for one ninety nine. So nobody's buying your new CD for seventeen ninety nine. They're gonna buy. They might buy the t- the brand new in wrapping two ninety nine version anyway. So, uh, I stopped worrying about that probably five years ago. I'm just like, yeah, it's out. It goes everywhere. If people want to buy it, I'm so grateful. But I would just love it if you listen to the music. That That's enough for me. Absolutely. And I think I think that's the new paradigm. And I think that's the that's the age that we're in. And uh, that's just going to keep being more, more of a widespread uh, take on things. Yeah. I mean, you know, a company like Spotify, that's not even profitable every year. You know, if we could just get them profitable and then they can pay us literally – 10% more, 5% more, people could actually be making, people meaning artists, could actually be making uh, a good chunk of change. So I think we need to focus on the economics of streaming rather than fighting streaming. Definitely, because definitely here to stay, no doubt about it. So tell us a little bit about uh, your album that was just released in September, and then I believe you have one coming up for early next year. So if you can just say a few words about those, I think that would be uh, really cool. Cool. Uh, well, I put out... Uh, a duo record with a great friend of mine named Chris Ziemba, who we grew up together. He's from Buffalo, and we've been playing together since that high school big band that I talked about. We released a record that we made at 
uh, Pinch Recording, which is a studio in Long Island City, in the city, and they um, this was also a chance for Outside End Music and Pinch to collaborate on some uh, some brand collateral. So we kind of worked together with them to put out some content for them and for us. So this record was a result of that. So there's uh, it's a bunch of standards and. Chris and I, this is our third record together as a duo. And so that's out. It's called Live at Pinch Recording, Nick Finzer and Chris Siemba. You can find it on all the places that we just talked about. But uh, that and then my sextet, which is my, my usual band that I've had together since college, uh, has a new record coming in Feb- end of February 2020, and that's called Cast of Characters. And so that's uh, going to be the fifth installment from, from that group. But you can look out for that uh, in 2020. Right on, man. And uh, where is the best uh, place or places to uh, find out uh, what you're doing? Uh, Instagram, number one. And number two, it, well, actually, number one is the website, nickfinzermusic.com. And then Instagram is uh, the place I'm most active on social media, at Beautiful. Nick Finzer. Beautiful, man. Hey, man, this was awesome. I feel really good yeah, about thanks, this. Yeah, thanks, Yeah, this was, a, this was a really good time. And uh, I think you've covered a lot of territory and a lot of stuff that uh, people don't usually get to hear a lot of specific information about. So I'm really happy to be able to uh, talk to you today and be able to share that information with the audience. Totally. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And hopefully some people get some value out of it. I think, I think that's safe to say. So stay on the line for one sec and uh, thanks again, Nick. Yeah, you're welcome, man. Thank you guys so much for checking out the podcast and don't forget to subscribe wherever you happen to be listening to this and you can always go to berniesbootlegs.com for more episodes. Thanks again and see you guys next time.